topic. Uh, so we're moving into our second main panel for uh, today. And there is a shift that we did in the agenda. Sister Marianne Farina will be chairing this panel. Uh, the reason tomorrow she's unable to be with us, so I switched my role with uh, Sister uh, uh, Farian Marina, who's been with us uh, almost for all of the Islamophobia conferences. Uh, she's the acting president of the Dominican School of uh, Theology and Philosophy. Uh, part of the GTU, Graduate Theological Union up in the hill. Uh, it's a partner with us, and uh, Sister Marianne, it's all yours to introduce the panel and take us through this. Good afternoon, everyone. This is really an honor to be a part of such a critical discussion. And as Dr. Bazian has said, we've been at this for 17 years at least, and um, such a significant part of the scholarship that has been developed from these conferences has now become really a permanent uh, resource for future research, writing, and study of our students. So this has really been spectacular. This afternoon, uh, we have the second part of a panel's discussions that are disrupting narratives of Islamophobia the Qatar 2022 World Cup. And we have four distinguished panelists who will be a part of this session. Our first panelist, uh, Dr. Khalid Fahad Al-Qatar, is the policymaking director at Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Qatar. Al-Qatar is also the founder of Powered by Hekaya, a platform for equalizing narratives and supporting critical approach narratives from the region and for the region. His topic will be the politics of narratives, a World Cup disruptive. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Al-Akhtar. Thank you, Marianne, for this kind of introduction. And let me begin by thanking the organizers for this timely conference. It is something very important for us in Qatar uh, on looking at the issue of is countering Islamophobia as we have been developing our understanding of this, of this phenomenon in the past three to four years as Qatar faced, faced uh, accusations in different parts of its foreign policy making of, uh, of being framed in very negative ways. And the World Cup, in that sense, has been our eminent event, the most prominent event we've had, which Islamophobia became a strong, um, made a strong showing on. So, um, so the case of Qatar hosting the FIFA World Cup about Islamophobia underscores uh, the way many regions and wider Muslim realm is narrativized and subsequently instrumentalized in much Western framing. Hence, the purpose of this brief presentation on my paper is threefold. First, I look at how depictions and narratives about Qatar as the host of the World Cup materialized within an almost exclusively Eurocentric Islamophobic frame set. It could be argued that these depictions even led to unprecedented accelerations and reproductions of Islamophobia. Second, I assert that the ways in which Qatar designed its hosting of the tournament recenters such a narratives. I will explain the ways in which the tournament itself, Qatar's policies, the experiences that took place were able to balance the Islamophobic narrative that attempted to delegitimize and undermine the fact that my country, Islamic, Muslim, and Arab, was hosting the World Cup. Third, I look at the implications of our hosting of the World Cup and how it can be utilized to expand on conceptions of legacy. I question whether Qatar's recentering of the narrative of the narrative was temporary or whether they can be utilized more sustainably. In the run up to the World Cup, the promotion and propagation of Islamophobic imagery and narratives demonstrated the continuation of neo colonial mindset, policies, and ways of shaping the global order. What this means is, this, is that the World Cup in Qatar can be perceived as an example of a discursive resistance 
to such a Islamophobic narratives. As we know, Islamophobia is about forms of othering, especially if it doesn't fit within a Eurocentric lens of what a state and society should like, should look like, and this is an important point. Othering Muslims is deployed to validate policies, both domestic and foreign, to confine or limit agency and legitimate power. So an interesting point here is really looking at this as an international politic events and how Islamophobia actually manifests itself in such a multi, uh, in, in a such a um, huge event, a global event, rather than how it manifests itself domestically, which is also another dimension of Islamophobia, and which we have heard many good examples of in the previous panel. So Qatar's role in the international order has demonstrated that you can play the game, but you don't need to engage on such a friends or boundary settings by completely giving up your identity and values. And so you have to really have diplomacy to engage and you set the boundaries yourself, what is possible and where the limits are. And so this has been part of our diplomacy and our, and our part of our policy making uh, process. Qatar uses its resources as a state to make its mark on the international order through soft power. Though it encounters relentless campaigns of delegitimization for doing so. So we have a scene setter here. If we go back to December 2010, the FIFA announced that Qatar bid has succeeded. We won the World Cup, and from then on, from that time when we have won the bid, we faced huge criticism and uh, narratives just starting coming up in different, uh, in different, uh, in, in global media. Qatar will be the first Muslim and Arab country to host the tournament. This immediately set expectations, and almost immediately a vicious anti-Muslim, Islamophobic, and racist backlash was evident in much Western discourse and media coverage about our country. The predominantly Western prejudice that feeds anti-Muslim hate, discrimination, and violence was gathered and focused squarely on Qatar. This is how many in Qatar talk about Islamophobia that unfolded. Qataris were exoticized, depicted as unsafe, reductive tropes about Qatar women as oppressed and hidden, something which we'll hear more from, from, from the next speaker, were repeatedly deployed. Qatar was described as water insecure, conjuring up images of a dry desert nation with primitive problems. It is well understood why and when these images were invoked. This imagery and many others act to reinforce orientalist frames of what is Muslim. These takes amplified Islamophobic societal positioning and institutional, including governmental policies, towards Qatar. Media was the primary vehicle for this. And we can see an example of this. Obviously, particularly when compared to other World Cups or um, mega sport events, such as the Olympics, European and wider Western media, Qatar was treated differently. A chain of orientalist knowledge production, not just reflected in Qatar, but also more broadly on our region, positionality in the international system, and on our values and beliefs. The cartoon here is but one example of this. Which shows after Qataris, not only Qataris, but also Muslims as terrorists. This was in a French paper, by the way. The tournament, recentering the narrative. So my argument is actually the World Cup through um, our policies and I think what came, we really managed to recenter the narrative on the, the Islamophobic narrative and something, and in this way it was really disruptive, disruptive in terms of Islamophobia. The fan and visitor experience displayed through social media and other means almost immediately worked to debunk the, host, the hostile anti-Muslim tropes and narratives. Actually, on the social media here, I have to mention something um, which is which needs to be looked at more intensively in terms of, of journalism and how media really can be disruptive, social media disrupting the mainstream media. Uh, in Qatar, we are, we are very um, blessed in terms of having, the, the, having that fan experience, actually, which enabled, uh, and the social experience, and uh, fans 
uh, you know, we gave them, we had to give them actually because of how the way they entered um, the stadiums and the, so they used an app called uh, the Hire System. And so this Hire System required them to have free data because this is the way uh, tickets were activated as they became, as they went to the stadiums. So they had unlimited data. So actually one effect of that was that fans enjoyed streaming through different social apps, all their experiences, and that became really dominant, and that became the primary vehicle, social media, how it really changed much of the official media and the mainstream media, because these were the voices of individuals, the voices of fan experiences, and they were their life, and it's, they were, it's impossible to say they were orchestrated or they were manufactured in any sort of way because of, of the breadth of these and the number of these of, of these postings which went on day and night from different places. And so these experiences are really, um, were really very instrumental. The individual experiences and storytelling were very instrumental in changing the narratives and really bringing what Qatar is really about and the fan experience to the global media. And then we saw from that and how media really started changing its own uh, uh, stories on that, um, even hostile media, some of the hostile media. Um, so success, so we had a big success in disrupting the Islamophobic narrative and uh, one of the example of this is the opening ceremony, which we can Look at, so we have the opening ceremony of mega sporting events are considered opportunities to project and characterize the power, culture, and image of the hosting countries. For Qatar, the ceremony represented a magnificent moment of public diplomacy and an opportunity to frame our country and for Arabs and Muslims around the globe. And among the many repertoires that audiences have come to expect from such events, the fireworks and such, one stood out. In a segment of the ceremony entitled The Calling, for the first time in the history of the opening ceremonies of World Cup, the beginning came with a Qatari uh, call, so a recitation of the Quran, and the World Cup ambassador, Ghanim al Muftah, who you can see here in the photo, sitting with Morgan Freeman for the recitation of verses from the Quran. A richly enacted narrative of a Qatari Muslim nation was tied to hospitality and welcome to all. And again, if you go to the social media of fans really enjoying themselves, and it was a moment where fans experienced hospitality, but also were able to, to, to connect in ways which is unprecedented. Connection between South to South, uh, it was unprecedented how we saw uh, Mexican fans enjoying themselves and really having fun with uh, Saudi fans, for example, singing and dancing. And, you know, um, it, was, it was incredible. There were, there were many images where fans across, across the globe really connected in many different ways. And we credit really social media for having to bring this, you know, for having brought this, many of these positive images out. So dynamic emerged and spaces of forms of solidarity emerged organically, safe communal spaces, South South, Arab Muslim, Muslim Muslim, and Muslim European. It centered Qatar on the international stage even further. Qatari, um, we put to share, so what happened is actually the conclusion of this is our legacy is really we put to shame a reductive essentialist and orientalist tropes revealing the hostile nature and intense. So this was one of the consequences. I think many people saw Qatar, so the experience, which is only not Qatar, I must emphasize it was about experiencing Arabs, it was about experiencing Muslims, a country which has been not understood or an area of part of the world which has always seen really in a very negative light. And so we succeeded really in encountering many of these um, uh, narratives. So we asserted our identity in our own terms, according to our own norms and values, while remaining in line with FIFA requirements. This is achieved, so we showed that this is achievable and, we can, and can be extended to other domains beyond sport. And we hope that, you know, that this experience will be looked out and uh, looked at and examined and identifying lessons how this can be really also taken to, to the next step. So one of the legacies of the 2022 World Cup um, was to create a discourse of space where Islam can be legitimate where Islam can legitimately claim a positive contribution.
in action, Qatar, we signed an agreement, as the United States are also hosting the next World Cup uh, and other countries. So we, we signed an agreement to build some World Cup legacies through bilateral cooperation and knowledge, knowledge exchange. Legacy of Qatar's success is now part of wider effort by our, our government to support efforts to combat racism, including Islamophobia and xenophobia. In conclusion, Qatar's experience of hosting the World Cup exposed how deeply rooted some forms of anti-Muslim hate remain. Qatar, however, defied the expectation that it would conform to Eurocentrically and Western-determined mega-sporting event. So I'm proud to say that Qatar hosted the tournament on its own terms. As a consequence, Islam and Muslims were positioned in front and center. Qatar hosting of the FIFA World Cup 2022 created a significantly empirically rich set of new data with which scholars in the future can work. The, ge the geopolitical reality shaped by growing polarization and disunity that in turn is rooted in the nature of the international system and for Qatar, we were able to unite the world and decenter the debate about Islamophobia. Thank you. is we're speaking louder. Those were the voices that came forward. Those were the voices that were the discursive resistance to the Islamic othering. Thank you so much. Our next paper is um, being presented by um, Mr. Mohammed Abdullah al Um Is that correct? Oh, no. Amna? Amna? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, Ms. Amna Khalid Al Tahani is in the Department of Policy Making at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar. Al Tahani's policy and research work focuses on interfaces between Islamophobia, anti Muslim hate, and policies that tackle them in wider frame of initiatives on combating racism and religious hate. Her paper will look at Islamophobia and the discourses gendering Qatar's hosting of the World Cup. Please join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Atahani. Um, so, uh, the paper that I will be presenting is about um, Islamophobia and discourses gendering Qatar's hosting of the World Cup. Before the World Cup and leading up to it, there was a heavy amount of criticism on the FIFA uh, World Cup in Qatar. It centered on many different questions, but one of the most... Um, sorry. One of the most uh, prominent discussions was on the um, issue of women. Um, whether it be reports on Muslim or local women or, uh, and their rights in society or visiting women and how they might be treated, uh, it's, it doesn't show on the screen, though. On the screen. Okay. Okay. Um, or the or women's safety. Many of the, these narratives were circling around the usual Islamophobic narratives, dress, visibility, or invisibility, and the placement of all rights of women in a Muslim country. Uh, historically, Islamophobia has uh, has always targeted women from tropes of the rescue narrative or the idea that modesty or veiling represents oppression, 
classical Orientalism made appearances in framing of uh, Qatar's religious and cultural values through the lens of patriarchal norms, reinforcing them on women as being passive. Presenting Qatari women to not show agency, denigrating their power, and not recognizing the fact that Qatari women are more educated than their male counterparts, with more university graduates being women in Qatar. We have several women ministers, and women are an important part of our society in every aspect. Uh, we also saw many attempts to denigrate Qatar's soft power, soft and symbolic power credentials. One such example uh, with the article titled, the Qatar World Cup is beaming misogyny around the world, claiming that discrimination against women is enshrined in Qatari law. The article ends with, by holding the men's World Cup in Qatar and thereby not sanctioning the lack of progress the country has made in terms of women's rights. Uh, one of the biggest points was how will Qatar protect women in the, uh, who face uh, sexual uh, allegations, sexual assault allegations, or are, are victims of sexual assault. As within major sporting events, women face a heightened risk of sexual assault. However, we saw that because in Qatar we abide by female sa safe spaces, we have, for example, women's only lines, uh, to entrance to stadiums, so that women would be checking on women. This uh, lessened the risk of any misconduct, and thankfully we didn't have any reports of uh, misconduct during the tournament, which was we're, we're, we're proud of that. Um, even though online, uh, some uh, some uh, people who wanted to criticize Qatar made it seem as it was as if these separate lines were some form of inequality that we have in Qatar, without even questioning why, as Qataris, we would want these spaces, which is we uh, they provide us privacy and respect. And this is saying you have men checking men, so it's equal. <sighs> Uh, there are also a lot of uh, issues brought up against uh, Muslim women or local women or Qatari women for the tournament. The position of women in Qatar is often viewed, uh, this is a quote, the position of women in Qatar is often viewed from the outside as one that is bound by religious and patriarchal constraint, reinforced by the invisibility of women from much of the international sporting world. So from the very first game, you saw reports of the invisibility of local women, questioning where are the women on, where are the, women on the stands. But they fail to understand the, our cultural norms, which is women barely enter into the public domain uh, uh, in media coverage, but doesn't mean that they're not there. And then we had Qatar's female leaders present highly visible in games. Um, these signaled agency, power, and autonomy, complete contradistinction to hostile narratives of Qatari women as Islamic women, as secondary citizens. Muslim women who were very visible during the tournament, the Moroccan team's mothers, the Moroccan team, of course, and their mothers, they were visible because they made it, the team made it farther than any other African or Arab team in history. Um, after every game, you saw the players celebrating and embracing their mothers. Instead of showing the highest team people held their mothers in Muslim societies, a European news outlet went as far as to compare these mothers to monkeys, later apologizing, as you can see here on screen. Uh, while questioning the rights of, uh, of women in Qatar, one, one uh, article claimed the rights of women in Qatar are developed despite the most women in public are veiled, which is purely an Islamophobic statement in which mother stressed or veiling is inherently linked to being underdeveloped. Uh, and uh, concerning uh, visiting women, uh, a lot of them uh, leading up to the to the tournament, we were warned about dangers of visiting Qatar. With headlines such as "Why women uh, Why women football fans fear for their safety at World uh, World Cup in Qatar," even though Qatar is always always tops reports for being one of the safest countries in the world. There were official looking flyers circulated on social media describing cultural expectations for fans attending the World Cup. Some included rules for women's attire, shoulders and knees must be covered. Advising, advising those who had to follow to, follow, uh, to, do, to head to Doha followed a strict dress code. While a local organizing committee, the committee has suggested fans respect the culture, no one was detained or barred from games because of clothing. But persistent rumors swirled around appropriate and modest clothing. This drew the attention to countries' record on equality, claiming that in women in public, women in Qatar are expected to dress up to cover up, but the, what we choose to ignore is both men and women in our culture followed certain de dress codes. And that's just how Islam sees the public domain that um, Qatar we follow. 
Um, additionally, the Times of London published that Qataris are unaccustomed to seeing women in Western dress in their country, and a photo caption that was later deleted after being flagged on social media. However, around 87% of the country's population of 2.9 million is made up of expats, many of whom are women. So anyone visiting the region, especially, specifically Qatar, will see that it's very multicultural, and foreigners do need to respect local customs, but they are free to dress as they please. So the notion that uh, these, this Western dress would be strange is preposterous. Uh, the tournament was criticized for not being up to Eurocentric standards. The idea of sports as a vehicle of women's liberation. So before the tournament, we saw, we saw the media focus on where the Qatar women's football team was, assisting that the reason they haven't played in a couple of years due to the patriarchy. A report stated that the team has come under uh, the Qatar Women's Sport Committee, which sounds like a progressive move from a country where some women wear the full veil. That's an exact quote. The rhetoric around Qatar shows that some Western critics have been more concerned with feeding into an Oriental's discourse and language aimed at imposing Western worldviews than human rights. We saw many counter narratives during the tournament itself. Uh, women reported being feeling extremely safe during the World Cup. This is because there was no, uh, one of the reasons was there was no alcohol in public areas, only designated areas, making it very family and women friendly. Women, tra women traveling alone to Qatar reported feeling respected by everyone. This is when the power of social media came. Women from all over the world provided a counter narrative to all the criticism in their own words, saying that they felt extremely safe in walk around alone at night, something they would be able to do in other global cities. For the first time in history during the tournament, there were three female referees at the Men's World Cup. But still, we saw reports of these female referees that they will not face cultural or religious restrictions, even though that was never clarified what that would mean. One of the most positive aspects of the tournament is the number of local women, especially young ones, in the stadiums, be it Qatar or residents. Uh, Accessibility-wise, uh, it was the first tournament in the region, so it provided women in the neighboring countries to have a chance to take part in this global event for the first time. So again, like Dr. Khalid highlighted before me, the power of social media was very powerful during this tournament. Uh, we saw people, uh, we saw women specifically take control of their own narrative, give first-hand uh, basis of their experiences. We saw women from all over the world, um, from Europe, from North and South America, from Asia and Africa, explain how safe they felt, how they, how this experience was so different from other major sporting events that they had been to, uh, been to, and that coming to the Qatar or the Middle East, as they said, uh, as women, they were warned of these dangers, but they were, they were, uh, what they got, uh, got was a completely different experience. So in conclusion, we see the topic of gender and women as a, a big topic during uh, uh, the lead up and during the tournament, with criticism uh, being on classic and neurotropes of Islamophobia, whether it be Muslim, or Muslim women, Qatari, or, or local women, visiting women, we saw headlines that questions women's rights in Qatari society, to the extent of questioning its, its adherence to human rights, largely ignoring the facts on the ground, which, which show the placement of women in uh, Muslim society or in Qatari society specifically. Fears were put, in, for, put into visiting women about impositions on clothing, on safety, and even women's only spaces were, were need to look at as um, to look as a sign of subordination of women. When in uh, in reality, it was a it was a positive aspect of the tournament. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Uh, wonderful presentation about the issue of women in the Qatar World Cup and the Islamophobic narratives that did not recognize the importance of women's power in the country because they did not understand the culture. They focused on Western world views and the Orientalist glasses blinded them and they really didn't see Qatar's women or any of the women that were there at the World Cup. So thank you very much for your information. Our next uh, panelist is um, Mr. Mohammed Abdullah al Khwari. Uh, he is in the Department of Policy Planning at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar. 
Al-Khawari's policy and research work extends to contextualization policy narratives on extremism and critical interrogation of Islamophobia. And his presentation uh, this afternoon is Qatar's hosting the World Cup uh, decolonial sports-based repertories. Welcome. Please welcome uh, Mr. <laughs> Al-Khawari. Our experience in the World Cup. As some of you may know, Qatar was a British protectorate until our independence in 1971. And our form of colonialism is a bit different in the Gulf as the Qatari experience was uh, different with that. After that, I would like to speak more about how uh, the only quote I had from an expert was uh, by Dr. Salman, who's attending with us today. And uh, it's really interesting for us to view how still in the beginning when colonizing powers wanted to colonize countries, they had to study a bit more about culture, habit, religion being a big part of the region. And as Dr. Salman so eloquently mentions, they chose to, ho to have that type of study and to have that type of doctrine in the oriental departments of schools. And until this day, most of, most of institutions discussing Islam and discussing some parts of Islamophobia is still considered under oriental studies and oriental schools. So that kind of sets the scene for what I'm about to say afterwards. Since the norm becoming major sporting events being organized and being historically held by colonizing countries and colonizing powers, it was extremely challenging for Qatar to, to, to get the, the, after winning the bid, to get the acceptance of an Arab and a Muslim country hosting the World Cup. As historically, these events have been held by Western countries, and other countries will attend. So after the Qatar winning of the bid, the wave began by starting to criticize every aspect of the Qatari culture the Western media could get. And this was all done in a Eurocentric lens towards Qatar. So these claims and these targets against Qatar were masking the Islamophobia, West, the Islamophobic sentiments towards the host for the, weather, for the World Cup. In Qatar, we came under audit for 12 years, starting with starting to boycott the games and asking international teams to boycott the games and not attend. And then after that, moving into asking the fans not to attend and asking the fans that you will be apprehended if you do that, you will be prosecuted if you do that, this and this and that. All an attempt to discourage fans from attending and enjoying the World Cup. The, G the D legitimizing of the Qatar state and str the Qatar state and the, our strategic autonomy became when the Eurocentric lens tried to impose certain set of standards as they view it to deter us from having an enjoyable experience to the fans and everyone participating in the World Cup. So, from trying to have an exclusion propaganda, starting with the teams, going to the fans, to an inclusion experience. Roughly 3.4 million people attended the World Cup. And I just want to take a minute to really soak in that number. The Qatari attendance is the second highest after the United States. If you talk about the geographical location, if you talk about 
the population inside the country, like Qatar is roughly around 2.9, the US is 300 million. So having the second highest attendance shows you that the people came and the people enjoyed a safe space. And it was all created in a way where uh, the, the transaction between the people and the fans were organic and it was grassroots. So combating Islamophobia within the World Cup experience happened grassroots. It was organic by welcoming everyone, by allowing everyone to interact freely with the people and removing any pre tendencies or pre-biases about, you know, starting from the media with the people wearing the long robes and the long facial hair and the chants and the screaming. All of that was, was in a way debunked in our own inclusive, holistic experience. So, we maintained our values by having no compromise on either our values, our beliefs, or our hospitality. As we believe in Qatar, these three things are non-negotiable. Also, I would like to mention that we had a very simple strategy and it worked out perfectly for Islamophobia. By, happy, by having open doors, houses, and stadiums, this was the Qatari approach to display a bright example of a multi-layered approach to Islamophobia. Qatar is not the first country to host an international event, definitely. And it's not the first country to first Muslim majority country or a Muslim country to host an international event. But historically, when Western tourists tend to visit countries, they tend not to, mean to visit the Gulf. By visiting the Gulf and by being emerged in the culture and being emerged and having stadiums from one part of Qatar to the other, they experienced a spectrum of cultural and, and religious values in a way that was, as I mentioned, multi-layered in a sense. As you can see in the picture here, this is fans wearing their own version of the thobe. So as I mentioned earlier, it is historic in all, you know, ancient and even modern movies that they will have, you know, the, the long thobes and the long dresses and the women wearing black top to bottom and it was always stereotypical in a sense. After 9-11 it shifted from Arab into Islam and etc etc etc. That picture to me speaks a lot. As you can see these are fans enjoying their flags on a thobe and enjoying it on a ghitra. It shows that they accepted to, to have a part of the culture with them that they no longer have that bias of, oh no, I'm not going to wear something like that, in a sense. If you can see in the picture here, this is a mosque that has a glass facade. So most people might not uh, take much in this, but it's actually a very interesting model that was adapted in Qatar. You can visit mosques if you want, you can in almost all countries, you can visit mosques. But many people, and let's say, people with biases against Islam or people who might have Islamophobic tendencies will not, let's say, put it on their agenda to visit a mosque. But by having a clear glass facade on a mosque here, you kind of take away that, what are they doing inside the mosque? What are they doing inside, just, just there. And this is what I mean by an organic experience. It's, it's there if they wish to see it, it's not there if they, if, they, if they don't wish to see it as well. So by having that, we, it was noticed that many people just kept on standing and watching the ritual of prayer, seeing what's happening inside. After that, I would like to speak about Haya. So we mentioned the 3.4 attendance. It was noticed that many of the fans that were limited to bring more family members in the World Cup returned and they started coming again and again and again. And these are fans from all over the world. They decided to extend the Haya entry it's for visa purposes and etc. But they decided to extend that because as I mentioned, the system works. Hosting a fan initiative. Hosting a fan initiative is an initiative that basically created a platform for spectators, 
around the world to be hosted by a family in Qatar. And to enter one's home is to be very personal and up close with them. So that initiative really resonated well throughout. Of course, when we're talking about major sporting events, we're talking about a whole scheme of organizational structures that need to be adapted to take in the numbers and to take in the logistics and to take in the great volume of, fa of sorry, fans coming in. So by adapting the Qatari model and by proving it works, other Muslim countries will successfully debunk the pre-tendencies of not being able to host great major sporting events. And we can see this in FIFA, for example, where you have other Arab countries who are planning to, or displaying their intent to host other events as well. I personally believe one way to answer Islamophobia or to, to combat Islamophobia is by seeing it with your own eyes, visiting the country, interacting with people. I'm not talking about forced interaction here, and I'm not talking lectures are important, but I'm not talking about it in a lecture way. I'm talking about walking in the streets, interacting with people, going to the souks, going to the to seeing the mosques. And this is this is the way I believe the system in Qatar worked by having everything displayed for everyone to participate in if they want. Qatar will continue to share and cooperate with our international actors, being an international country in combating Islamophobia and a global state. One part of this, of course, is our help and our cooperation with people who are looking to host major events and hosting major sporting events. And by the way, uh, the Qatar signed uh, a memorandum of understanding with the United States in sharing best practices and sharing best knowledges when it comes to the, to the World Cup. So if we're partnering up with the United States, that means the Qatar model works. This comes from our firm belief of dialogue and peaceful resolution of conflict. The Qatari model for hosting the 2022 World Cup has already and will continue to be adopted by other countries throughout the spectrum. Many Muslim majority countries will rely on the experiences that was conducted in Qatar and hosting their own version at their own speed of major sporting events. And the importance of major sporting events does not only relate to sports itself, but sports is a peaceful and happy way to unite people and to let aside their differences and to, to convene in a place for the better good. I'm trying to be very concise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, you called it out clearly. Uh, hard to accept that Qatar was going to host the World Cup. That was that was at the heart of it. And as you pointed out, the Eurocentric lens attempting to delegitimize the state um, by this kind of exclusionary propaganda. And yet, as we saw in many of these papers, the truth won out because of the experiences. People's voices spoke louder. The free and natural connections that gave witness to the authentic values and beliefs of the country and the power, which you showed us, of Qatar's multi-layered cultural hospitality. The glass mosques in the metro, what a brilliant idea. Now that we've signed the Memo of Understanding, US and Qatar, what should we make glass so people can see in? Maybe our universities. Um, but they're really wonderful, the various strategies and how Qatar now hold, is a model for other countries as we're hosting these global events, that we may truly see one another. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is Beverly Milton Edwards. And Beverly, uh, Professor Edwards works on as a senior policy advisor in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Professor Milton Edwards is widely recognized as a leading academic scholar of Islamism, Islamic movements, and the Middle East. Her books include Islam and Politics in the Contemporary World, Islam and Violence in the Modern Era, and Islamic Fundamentalism since 1945. 
Her paper this afternoon is The Beautiful Game, For Some, Not All, Contextual, contextual Framing of Islamophobia in Football. Please join me in welcoming Professor Milton Edwards. us down a little bit. Um, any chanting appreciated. Uh, one other disclaimer is that um, with all due respect to uh, North America, I am English, so when I talk about football, I don't mean the game with the big pieces of armor. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it would be inauthentic of me to uh, talk about soccer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, uh, ju ju just to sort of bring us back to what this conference is about, because I think it's actually really rather important, uh, you know, uh, as, as was discussed earlier this morning in the opening sessions, um, part of this conference is not just about talking about Islamophobia and experiences of Islamophobia, but about knowledge production. And uh, in thinking about my, my topic today, um, it really struck me that within the field of sport and the study of sport and the academic scrutiny of sport, um, this is very much this topic, this link to um, forms of racism, including um, Muslim hate or Muslim racism, anti-Muslim racism, is that, this, that there's, there's, a, there's just an absence, an absenting. I will talk about othering, but there's also an absenting. And I think that um, one significant outcome of the tournament being held in, in Qatar um, is that it alerts us to the fact that we really ought to be doing a lot more work on this topic. And that uh, I think that perhaps the tournament being held in Qatar will allow us to think about evidence bases and how we capture evidence. And again, if I think back to the first session this morning, um, those, those forms of digital artifacts, which my colleagues referred to and, and were very much present in discussing the Canadian experience, might be one way in which we think about that. Anyway, let me begin properly. Um, of course, they do call it the beautiful game, football. And I don't know how many of you in this room are actually football fans. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Okay, yeah, players, fans, occasionally watch it. I don't know if anybody watched it during during the World Cup. But uh, for those of you who aren't followers of the beautiful game, therefore it might be a surprise to you that literally billions of people across the world love and enjoy the sport of, of football. It delivers huge, as my colleagues have said, huge opportunities for enjoyment um, and its popularity has been viewed by those who control it, and obviously today I'm going to be talking about FIFA as an opportunity. Indeed, it's a twofold opportunity. An opportunity to make lots of money, and to secondly use the sport, to use football as a vehicle for forms of political, with small p and a big p, um, cultural and ideological messaging control and even historically, um, or we may even say even in the present day, forms of exploitation. Now, this framing of the game reveals many issues as they relate to racism, and obviously for the purposes of my presentation, um, discrimination and hate or anti-Muslim racism. 
So in exploring this topic, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to look at football and FIFA as the form of framing the global game. I'm going to talk about football and Islamophobia. And then I'm going to extend on the Qatar World Cup. And hopefully I won't be repeating anything that my colleagues have already said. So let's think about how the game is framed. Uh, and we can see really from this very earliest forms that football really very much is a European he hegemonizing project. It has been, as Sugden and Tomlinson remind us, um, and this sort of, there was a sort of a growth of new literature about football in academia in the 1990s. So we see it as a form of economic and cultural imperialism, particularly as we look at the relationship or the part that football played in the colonial and imperial projects in Africa and Asia in particular. They were used, it was used by colonizers to introduce forms of European discipline, European rules, and European norms um, against native and indigenous populations. Therefore, it always radiated out from Europe, it was always radiating and part of this, this colonial approach. And for sure, there was evidence to suggest that it eroded diversity and authenticity of local cultures and identities, including Muslim identities. And there's a very strong argument made in the literature that FIFA has always used the World Cup tournaments as a vehicle for promoting a specific homogeneous and standardization, a version of global culture that they have framed. So we're talking about a version of global culture that they claim is inclusive, that they claim is diverse. And if we see it uh, sort of hitched up to, in particular, um, the economic project, if you think about, you know, the Coca-Cola advertising. So, so it's, it's their version. It's not co-designed or co-created. It's their imagining, it's their framing of what this diverse world of football presents. Uh, my argument is, and I'm, I'm not alone in making this argument, that, okay, it's their version of, 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 of diverse, but it's not necessarily a version of inclusion, particularly if you think about Islam. And we see this very clearly in the way in which FIFA in the past handled the framing of the game with relation to um, Muslim forms of identity and dress, and in particular the hijab ban, um, which was a controversial policy. And that prohibited female football players from wearing headscarves on the on the pitch, and as a result of which, this prevented particular teams, the Iranian women's team, for example, in actually progressing in tournaments. So women were specifically discriminated against because of their um, identity. So let me now turn to part two of my presentation, which is about football and Islamophobia. Excuse me once I catch myself up on my script. So we can certainly suggest that even from um, the small amount of scholarship that is available to us, that there is a relationship between football and anti-Muslim racism. Um, the organizing frames of racism, anti-Muslim racism, and Islamophobia reveal diverse approaches. We can see that these forms of racism are institutional in terms of national and international football associations. Now, some argue that the reason why these attitudes are present is that, in a sense, football, like other things, is a microcosm of societal attitudes that in some senses it reflects a broader frame of racism, prejudice, and discrimination in sports. We do know that the limited amount of research has focused on either grassroots football in individual countries. A couple of years ago, there was a very important piece of research published by researchers in the UK on the experiences of players and officials involved in, in grassroots football, where there was certainly huge amounts of evidence of anti-Muslim racism and prejudice at work. 
And then we can see it in our broader perspective, um, particularly in the racist tropes and exploitation historically, and even in the present day in Africa and Asia by FIFA officials. And again, that includes what happens to Asian and African football talent that then becomes exported subject to forms of exploit exploitation um, and furthermore when those players and team officials make it make it they're made they don't become um, into european club football their experiences there so even within the limited field of scholarship we see plenty of evidence of the othering of muslim players officials and fans and i think it's very important because again when we tend to think about football we're either thinking about people on the field or the fans but there are officials there and the agency of officials within football particularly muslim officials within football is limited and reduced by the the mechanisms of these supranational organizations so their experiences of discrimination prejudice and religious hate are largely ignored or when they are made visible, they are signified as having an outlier effect. And we have the example here of uh, the Egyptian player, anybody a Liverpool supporter? No, well, never mind, there has to be one, I suppose. <laughs> so, Mohamed um, Saleh, who's an Egyptian football player, plays for Liverpool. He's still playing for Liverpool, actually. And. Uh, and, you know, there was this idea that somehow he was con contributing all on his own to um, a decrease in Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism. Uh, but on the other hand, it could be argued, as it has been, that there's actually no systematic evidence for these good news stories about good Muslims who teach British fans or any other kind of fans what Islam means or how Islam can be viewed and its relationship within football. So let me turn briefly to part three of my presentation um, and the World Cup in Qatar. Um, I don't need to say the obvious, it's up there on the side, that Islamophobia persists. And what, what we saw in, in Qatar during the World Cup was that as, as we drew closer and closer to the, to the start of the tournament, that there were forms of resistance and that FIFA officials didn't actually really know what to do with this. Some Muslim majority teams, as the big discussion about armbands, armband politics, um, and of course, this is this is resonant in, in, in the US with uh, your football, your kind of football, um, that there were discussions about whether in fact armbands could be could be worn by by, by team players, by Muslim majority teams to raise awareness of Islamophobia. Um, on that particular front, FIFA rejected it and it, it, it legitimated its rejection by referring to its armband policy. And, and indeed, it became very apparent um, for those of us, and I speak in a personal capacity here now, not as, a, as anybody who, I'm not speaking officially on behalf of the state of Qatar, um, but through my own experiences, it became very clear that there were tensions all along in, in preparations for the start of the tournament between FIFA's hegemonic narratives FIFA's power as the actor and what Qatar's frames might be, which my colleagues have pointed out, were far more mediated, actually. Yes, there was an, there was an opportunity for mediation of what this might mean. Um, and, of course, again, as my colleagues have pointed out, this, this FIFA narrative was reinforced by European media's obsession. Um, exposing the depths of anti-Western prejudice. And such anti-Muslim hostility was also performed as moral outrage. So we've already had some mention of, of Morocco, and I want to spe specifically talk about the, the Moroccan team and their progression in the tournament. 
they were signified as Muslim. They were signified, even though this wasn't actually the case, they were signified as the first Muslim country to top their group and the first country to reach the semifinals. And their Muslim identity was seen to be writ large on the field, in the stadiums and beyond. And this was seen as positive performative. A proud moment as some social media um, comments came from Muslim fans around the world. And yet, again, as my colleagues have pointed out, there was still this persistence, these reactionary responses and othering in repertoires of anti-Muslim race hate from politicians, from media, and again, including social media. And you'll see that I've just got a few of the exam examples there, some of which my colleagues have all mentioned. I think the interesting thing here in terms of, of FIFA, because after all, Qatar was the host, but it was the FIFA World Cup, was that in these reactionary and negative responses, FIFA never once called it out. Never once. There was no press release, no statement, no position taking. And even at the moment when, in a sense, FIFA took to the public stage to try and um, counter the negative narrative, I don't know how many of you are aware of a speech that was made by Gianni Infantino, who was the president of FIFA, and his famous, I am, today I feel Qatari, today I feel Arab, today I feel African, today I feel gay, disabled, and a migrant worker. But there is no mention of him today or any other day feeling Muslim. And I think that this was very much allowing a, a, an allowance by FIFA of some permissive positioning of those anti-Muslim positions. So I think, and again, just to echo what my colleagues have said, Qatar's hosting of the World Cup did expose this broad spectrum of anti-Muslim prejudice that is embedded in football culture. Okay, so, okay, the focus here was in Qatar, but it's everywhere, it's everywhere that football is played. So think about it in terms of that great, great global sport and the role that FIFA has to play. And yes, I mean, it's super to have brand ambassadors like David Beckham. FIFA ambassadors like David Beckham. But where are the Muslim FIFA ambassadors? Where is their voice? Where is their opportunity? So I think that by extension, it, it exposes the weakness of FIFA's own claims to power as a truly global federation. Yes, there was country pushback and proactive framing of, and at the tournament it turned out to be, as we've said, a tool of resistance that promoted authenticity and meaning to Islam. But at an epistemic level, and framed in the context of Qatar and symbols of Islam, we still have to question FIFA's signifier of the beautiful game in reproductions of its own power. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I love the title, The Beautiful Game of Football. I think you brought us full circle. How can it be a beautiful game? Well, that's when we de-Europeanize it, right? When we really allow it to be a global sport, as you were saying, and that football no longer became the vehicle for European cultural and political imp imperialization. So when will football be a truly global sport? Um, maybe when it's that kind of relationship that we saw happen in Qatar, where the players are working with other players, where the fans are enjoying their life together, then we've got something there. We have some question and answer, right? So some questions for our panelists, please uh, direct it to one panelist or to all the panelists. How would you like your question answered? Thank you. Thank you for such an interesting panel. I was struck by the fact that um, very close to the World Cup was another global um, convening in a Muslim majority country. It was the Climate Change Conference. 
Egypt has a very interesting human rights record. And yet, I didn't see a single article calling that out, even though it was hosting a global convening that was very, very high profile. So I'm just interested in, I think, just writing all this off as just generic Islamophobia, maybe this is a layer of what it really meant, because why wasn't Egypt targeted in the same way or the same exact things? And I, I'm still not sure of the answer. The other thing I just wanted to point out that I thought was very unique about the Qatari post is that it attempted to educate fans about Islam. And, and I have not ever seen um, a host of a, like a most majority host of a global convening attempt to do that in, in a very visible way. So I think that was very, I think that was a very unique aspect of the hosting. Um, I was also waiting for Egypt to do the same thing along the exact same, I mean, al al is right there, and it's like, how do you have this resource and not use it for the whole world is coming to your country to talk about climate change? So that was a you know a missed opportunity for, for Egypt, but that was never even thought to include like uh, education on Islam. Yeah, it was for Qatar to include Quran in, in the opening ceremony. I mean, people I don't I don't under, I don't know if it, if it's quite appreciated enough how much that meant to people, how much that meant to ordinary Muslims. We were you know we were all fighting back tears like oh my God there's Quran in this. Some people I mean. Literally billions of people are here in Quran that have never heard it before. Maybe so. I think that I, I think that maybe isn't a, isn't being um, fully you know um, appreciated enough that that was a very unique aspect of Kodan's uh, post posting on it. So I don't know if anyone can comment on why why these two, you know these two these two events happen so close together and and one was treated very differently than the other. Green. <laughs> <laughs> we already censored you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think so. And it has its own focus in the media, but it's not the same as with the World Cup. With the World Cup, we had 12 years, 13 years in terms of preparation for this. And so that time frame allowed it uh, many different narratives which it will help it to be sustained over many years. And so when the time came for the World Cup, I think there was so much pushback going on. And the result was exactly different. It had to be completely different. The World Cup wasn't as successful as it was. If there were any issues with the World Cup in terms of organization and incidents, but you didn't see the woman came to be the last, right? Even just came to be the last, which hasn't happened. That would have completely changed, I think, from sort of the media focus. So that's, um, that's a thing that now has not happened. It was successful in all aspects. Uh, children participation, uh, formal participation, security, safety. There was no incidents of theft, there was no incidents of, of, of any kind of violence. So, what made the difference is really the experience itself, the bad experience, the organization experience, the same thing, that there was really not much negative reports in the world. Um, 
and then not less for that sort of use. Uh, and that's that's because again the way the policy was implemented, people were seeing and people wouldn't just have a hard change when they can use the product. So there is not I'm sure there are many other reasons, but I would say one reason is really because of the way the work has succeeded. Definitely there was criticism for it, there was tons of criticism, but when it succeeded after that push back was. Now that doesn't mean really completely answer your question on why it just has been treated differently. Um, and the reading of that is a good question for you to raise and show the diversity of why uh, there isn't such a and, you know, the same kind of reading focus on that. Um, but of course, there are also lots of reports in that and in terms of you know, policy with such problems in terms of looking at Egypt, but again, policy things. Back and forth with the lines. So we have one more. Um, thank you very much. It was a really insightful panel. Uh, there's so many things that I want to say, and something I'll try and say later on. But I just wanted to pick up on one kind of theme throughout the thing, and that's the question about how to resist Islamophobia. And it tends to be two. One kind of idea of resisting Islamophobia has always been that if they come to know, Islam properly, they will stop being Islamophobic. And the response has always been in, in relation to this is that if you are a proper Islamophobe, um, then you are immune from any good deeds done by Muslims because you can always say they're only doing this as a form of the United States to fool us, etc., etc., whatever. But the thing that made me think a little bit more is look at the career of someone like Muhammad Ali, who similarly had a very kind of interruptive transformative process that a global figure who was both against the Vietnam War, who was revered mainly by the Third World, despised by a lot of the kind of liberal establishment, until he became so vague that they were basically they all said that we were always friends of Muhammad Ali, which is the case, etc. So there's an element of that, but in both cases, there wasn't an attempt to try and um, modify who he was. Um, and I think this is one of the central points that often when you have these kind of sporting and cultural events, they become user friendly for a particular European audience. Many, many years ago, I went to an exhibition in DC where they taken the German doors of the Kaaba and exhibited them in, in Washington, DC. And the idea was that when people would see this and somehow actually fall, uh, understand Islam better. But the actual violence of taking the doors of the Kaaba to DC itself to make it more palatable, I thought was actually more counterproductive than anything else that you could have done. So I think one of the things we'll talk about really is you to get this is that the message of the World Cup, and I think you made the point that listening to the Quran may not have meant anything to anyone else, but it meant a lot to at least a billion Muslims or so, just to simply behave that possibility. And those who can identify are adjacent to that and see that there's something different in there. So perhaps the real message is not so much that we should try and be um, in the frame of the good Muslim, but rather than to be in the frame of being who we are and let that take its own place. That the idea isn't for our narrative to be accommodating, but simply to say, this is where we are, this is who we are. And that's, that's your problem if you don't accept it. Like, for example, crime on alcohol, etc. Et so perhaps that's a strategy by Islamophobia, isn't one of accommodation. Perhaps it's about assertion in the face of what is being difficult to assert yourself. Anyone want to respond? Yes, I think in that respect, football was the most fantastic vehicle for that because uh, what we had was football fans of many persuasions. Uh, and if you think about a particular persuasion of a European football fan, well, that's where we're most likely to find our racists and our, and our Islamic folks, uh, and both, and all the other kinds of folks that they, that they are. Um, and so, in that, in that respect, you're absolutely right. Qatar, by being Qatar, by being authentic, by just being its, itself. 
um, was not what these fans were expecting. And it's not what, before they came, what they had been expect, what they had been told to expect. Um, I, had, I, had, I was in Qatar during the World Cup, and I was very lucky I went to the England Iran match. Yeah, and I had my ideas of what that match was going to, 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 to be like. Um, and standing in, in the queue with uh, British fans, mostly English fans, um, some of whom were dressed up with crosses. They were wearing you know, crosses of St. George, chain mail, chanting. Um, and I asked them, well, you know, what's it been like? And they were like, it's absolutely great. Just by being there and experiencing the country and being alongside other fans. And again, this is the other thing. It wasn't just about being with Qatari Muslim fans. It was about being with Iranian Muslim fans in that particular match. Or Moroccan Muslim fans, or Tunisian Muslim fans, or Indonesian Muslim fans. Um, it was just about that, that space for, for, for encounter. And that in and of itself became something very authentic. And in a sense, was facilitated by Qatar in the way in which it chose to organise the, the World Cup. Um, but in terms of other experiences, what I do want to say is, is that also, again, you know, that it was this experience, it was this moment for Muslim football fans. So on, on the first day of the tournament, I was up in a shopping centre, I ran into a group of guys who were looking at a map, you know, trying to figure out where they where they were. Um, and I found out that they were from, from London, they were Muslim British fans from London, from East London. And they were saying, oh, you know, where are the best places to go? We've heard that Qatar is nice to go to. It was a Friday. And, you know, and I said, oh, well, in Qatar there's a really nice mosque. And they're like, oh, this is amazing. We can go to the football, we can be tourists, and we can make our friends. Um, and it's not because there were specially constructed mosques. But imagine Friday prayer at, at the World Cup, it, it took place, it was there on the grounds, it was there for everybody to, to see. So again, that sort of inquisitiveness and that opportunity to be educated by osmosis. Um, and, 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 and the thing there is, is that that does have ripple effects, that does have triple down effects. Um, and I think that when we, should, we can think about that, is, I don't think we can say that for all European fan groups, but certainly European fan groups, and in particular English and Welsh fan groups, um, you know, those conversations will, will go back and they inform. And even if they're informing, that's a really good thing. It, it might not necessarily convert opinion, but they will inform opinion and they'll change a particular aspect of worldview and in particular, particular forms of hostility. So it's a point very well, very well made. Um, and I think it comes back to your point about, you know, this was beyond something perhaps generic that Cantar was doing. Um, I think it's important here not to overstate the claims, you know, that uh, with, with the deepest of respect to my country colleagues here, we didn't have a grand strategy that worked, and as his excellency has pointed out, you know, if one thing had gone wrong and we knew that, you know, when we're thinking about risk analysis, this could be diplomatic. Um, but, 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 but everything went, went in a particular way that showcased what could be, what might be, and what may be in the, may be in the future. Uh, thank you so much for that panel. I really enjoyed it. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the, that the event, the World Cup, was not it was not so much the football itself, but was seeing this sort of massive mainstream support for the Palestinian cause, uh, which you know it's it just it made me really. Um, and so what I'm curious about is, you know, it seems like there's a lot of intentionality within this event from the state. Was there sort of an intentionality behind promoting this cause because Club is one of the few, maybe you know, like the only country of Jesus who actually voices support openly for, for the Palestinian cause. Was there an intentionality behind this sort of support uh, in, in that event, or was it more organic? And as a follow up to that, 
uh, no one is kind of anecdotally, uh, not to say the issue, but on, me, on social media, we see more and more support for the Palestinian cause, uh, more than there was last year. A huge growth of this. And I'm wondering, since you're all working in the field of policy, if uh, you know the state is thinking in terms of you know, in terms of policy and, and uh, policy advisory, is there sort of a, a move towards using these types of events to advocate for this for this cause and to mainstream it more? So we take a few questions and then come back. Okay. Uh, from uh, my point of view, it wasn't intentional, it was very organic to end up, and that's what was so beautiful, that people from the state could get uh, out there in the for the first time in a major public event, a global event, and then you had a professor of liberty here, went viral, where they, she went viral and put the last time on the one of the first games, uh, <laughs> and she had to, uh, she, was, she became such a celebrity that people started taking photos with her, so she was <laughs> incognito. Um, <laughs> she, she, she's part of, she sparked a different now at the stage. Uh, um, so uh, I think it was very organic, and I think what shocked a lot of people is that with a lot of political changes in the recent, in recent years, people were confused at what the Arab street, as they call it, called it called what general Arab thought and all people have changed and, and it was an opportunity where uh, for people to younger generations and everyone essentially to just on any social media declare their content and I think that it it was in my opinion more organic but maybe that's the common thing. Yeah, I just like the idea I think it was totally organic so I really want to talk to that. And it wasn't the plan or um, in fact, it's important uh, to know that FIFA, the FIFA policy, FIFA has its own rules and regulations, um, and it pleases itself. And FIFA, um, in the wider discussion on flags and emblems, uh, FIFA officials have very, very strict and firm positions that it's that it expected Qatar and the Qatari state to uphold on uh, flags within 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 the stadiums. Um, so the notion of intention, intentionality, as my colleagues have said, no, there was no intention by the Qatari state. Um, but again, what happened was, was this sort of notion of, of um, social media creating the viral effect um, and, and this coming together. And as I said, it was space. And it was the first time that we've had the opportunity to enjoy this space and of course, the wonderful thing is, and when you talk about the uptick in um, support on, on social media, we can see that in surveys, particularly in North America. If you, you know, if you conduct surveys now in terms of support for sympathy to, or even knowledge of the Palestinian experience, historically and to the present day, in terms of the denial of rights, there's, there's definitely been an amplification. But it's not just down to Qatar, it's down to those social media figures like the Hadid sisters, for example, who, who are also able to amplify um, that, that, that moment and that, and that vibrancy. Um, and the fact that um, team players themselves uh, used, used and displayed the flag. So in a sense, they were the ones who were in using intentionality to defy these rules because they brought the Palestinian flag onto the pitch. It wasn't just fans in the stadium, it was those very brave players who defined the rules who could be subject to um, FIFA discipline as a result. I'm going to take uh, a question that might be a little bit difficult. In the lead up to the Qatar World Cup, there was a discussion about labor rights and the circumstances that were there, and that's definitely was very well prevalent in the Western media. But what was absent in this is the comparative. At the same time that there was writing in the Western press about labor rights, Europe has had experience the largest number of refugees being in concentration camps, literally, across the South. And then we have daily refugees that are drowning in the Mediterranean in the English Channel. So I would actually say that in dealing with other labor issues and labor rights, it's almost created the imagined geography. 
that this is where almost projecting it where Said the land of the barbarians, where this is what they do to, again, this is not undermining or not discussing about labor rights, because we had some horrific labor rights here in the United States during COVID. I say that people who uh, often access Amazon, Amazon has one of the highest rates of death on their processing lines and packaging lines, as well as ice and food uh, for those who eat meat, uh, has the highest per labor worker dying as a result of COVID, but that completely is erased. So how did the response or uh, this question relative to labor rights, how did the ministry and Qatar dealt with it? Because it still is one of those issues that is still in the character of the conversation without actually getting the larger questions on labor, not only in the Arab and Muslim world, but across Europe, especially we're dealing with uh, labor rights in France, in England, in uh, Italy, where literally we have the raising of the human on, on the sort of daily basis. So I know it's a difficult question, but that's <laughs> that we need to do. It. It's not difficult at all. It's uh, something we've been engaging in for many years, and there's a short answer to this. The short answer is we take, we took a lot of, of first of all, we have very high engagement with it, with IOL, and with all the institutions and media who, who, who talked about this. And so we took some of the, we worked constructively with many of the discussions on this, so there were some very difficult issues in Gibson Group, and so we worked on that, and so that was one positive aspect of this. The other thing I have to say is that Dallas camps are very much uh, inflated uh, media reports which have been uh, which have been uh, really circulating and it's interesting to see that how one media report can be for many years as a country or an individual or an institution or even in, you know, become so to a certain narrative or one report become circulated and not comes and without facts, without basis, it, it has its own life. So there was one report actually, uh, which really became a source of infamy for all these reports, the secret reports. It was, uh, it was a report by the Guardian, which said that there were 6,000 people who died in the construction, which is, you know, there was no proof at all of that. And, but it became circulated, it became part of a big discussion. I remember in a conference in, in the past few years ago, somebody stood up and said, yes. You know, there were thousands of deaths, and there were pain notes, after pain notes, and taking bodies, and people just accepted that. And it was, I couldn't, I didn't say anything, I was just part of the world, sitting there, and now I thought people can accept something like that. In the age of social media, where everything is documented, and if there were all things, you know, taking bodies out, I mean, somebody would have recorded that. Uh, and of course, there's nothing to document that. But all this has been debunked, and uh, the numbers are given on news. Somebody has to go and check the dialogue for the because we work for them. But check the result of the you know, numbers are and they can be really just you know, uh, you know, we say every every like that, but they will have just a very few you know, incidents of maybe so maybe less than thirty of deaths and you know you have to look at the reality of each of them what's happened with construction work or something outside. But again the point is that um, that became, uh, as you rightly say, an issue which depicted that in Kabbalah's life. You know, and that, you know, we always see that somewhere uh, in movies and the film and the cinema, uh, how the source of the picture in our countries are always, even if you know, they have nice buildings and high rises, we always see the desert first, for example, in the city and then the rest buildings which are out of place. And you'll see the soap always, whether it's in. in the soap was depicted in areas where it's something which is really negative, or you have a lot of negative experiences. And so, yes, the media was, the, it was the media really, which actually, um, I think, was the bigger problem rather than the facts themselves. Yeah, I mean, just, just to expand on that, first of all, let's be clear this was about deliberate disinformation. Um, the Guardian report, for instance, as you referred to, actually the Guardian themselves later um, published an apology and accepted that, that, that they were incorrect. On labour reforms, um, Qatar now has emerged as a leader, not just in the Gulf region, uh, but in North 
North Africa and probably over towards Asia in terms of um, labour rights, labour reform, uh, people working in Qatar entitled to a minimum wage. Uh, minimum wage is fair and just and supported by the, the, ILO, the ILO. Um so I mean similarly, you know, the same kind of distance with the Islamophobic and uh, anti-Muslim disinformation that, that, that Anna was talking about on, on women, Qatari women. In fact, enjoy the highest rates of employment for women across the Middle East and North Africa. As Anna pointed out, they are the most well educated. Women share in um, national power and decision making structures. They head ministries, they head departments. Um, their agent, agency is mega, but that doesn't fit with the disinformation stereotype. Even when we were talking about actually Muslim fans and Asian fans of the World Cup, the social media disinformation and actually media disinformation because it, oh these fans were being paid oh, because they couldn't they, you know, they couldn't calculate that Asian fans might support England. It didn't fit with their Islamophobic frame. Uh, we could literally sit here and go on for hours and hours about the amount of deliberate disinformation that was put out there for three years. We're going to take the last question. So, I didn't actually have a question. I have more of a comment on the topic of Muslims being, being themselves and on the question of the importance of representation uh, for Muslims. And, and I don't know, um, I'm not if you talked about this, I came in a little bit late, but I think that on the question of um, sort of the joy that was felt by so many Muslims in watching. The World Cup, I look like, and on the topic also of brave players uh, wearing the Palestinian flag on the field, I think that the Moroccan national team that uh, seems to me deserves a lot of credit for the kind of toyo feeling that a lot of us experienced in watching this. And, um, I was surprised that it wasn't mentioned more, so I just I thought it was important to bring that up. I think they deserve a lot of credit also for sort of offering that kind of representation and, and the space that was made for their moms, uh, especially those of us who live in the Muslim, non-Muslim majority countries, who are children of immigrants, whose parents, uh, you know, sort of experience a lot of similar uh, issues as the ones of the moms of some of these players. So I just wanted to mention that. Very interesting parallel you drew there, and I completely agree with you. Uh, the Moroccan team has been me personally very happy as, as an African and as an Arab team that advanced to that region. Uh, not a soccer or football expert myself, but I've enjoyed watching uh, the games definitely. And it is it is the space that you mentioned, and again. Um, we can, we can easily draw that the majority of these comments are revolving in a way or another about having that that space and that that uh, catalyst that allows all of these positive attributes and allows all of these positive uh, phenomena to be noticed or to be exemplified in a sense. I agree with you 100%. Thank you. Thank you. I do think that uh, just uh, a volume on uh, the 2022 World Cup is really needed, and I think maybe we could do a call for papers to specifically to deal with the various issues and then enlarge it to Islamophobia and sports. Uh, so I think this, uh, I could see a volume possibly giving us a year to try to put it together. It's a, a very important subject, especially as sports and its centrality in discourses will be very, very important. I still say that uh, sports in Europe and uh, football in Europe is one of the most racist grounds, uh, especially if you watch football in, in Italy, in Spain, 
in uh, France, in the UK, how often do you actually have bananas thrown on the soccer field or a football field when an African or an Arab or a Middle Eastern uh, plays uh, in the field? And yet we get the time and time again uh, figures from the global north and European countries standing to try to give us lessons about inclusivity, about diversity, about all these issues. Uh, where well, they fail to do it almost every Saturday and Sunday on the football field. Uh, and I think the record of players who, work, who play in those, on those uh, leagues uh, is illustrative of this. So thank you for uh, really coming and presenting in this conference. We're going to have a coffee break, so there's coffee outside. So please get yourself some caffeine so we could get into the conversation uh, in the last panel for today. Thank you.